Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to Construction Cast. This is the eighth week. Um, it's nice to have you here again joining us. Um, it's quite nice. On our eighth week, we're just tipping the point where we've had uh, over a thousand people join us over the last eight weeks. So thank you for joining us. And we was just discussing uh, just before the call about our webinar um, hosting is that Stuart and I are, are doing. We've been doing lots of these. So if anyone is having problems hosting webinars and wants to put on their own events, do get in touch. Our details are on the screen and we're, we're always happy to help out where we can. Um, we've got some speakers with us this week. We're going to be looking at the future of construction and the future of design and how things might change post post uh, coronavirus. Um, I'll introduce our speakers for you. Our first speaker is Sarah Fox, she's a construction lawyer with over 20 years experience. She's worked in the UK and abroad for clients from a one -woman, from one woman practices to global law firms, uh, specialist subcontractors to trade associations. She's the first person to write a construction contract in just 500 words to build trust. Yeah. Um, Sarah has written books on how to write simple letters of intent, consultant appointments, collateral warranties. She's spoken in the UK and internationally uh, with and consulted with organisations throughout the supply chain. Uh, dispute costs the industry billions, she says, each year, and she believes you can reduce your costs by starting a project with simple, effective con contracts. Uh, and Chris Kirby Turner is a partner at Thompson Stern Russell, which is the oldest law firm in operation. Chris received market recognition for his strong dispute resolution practice and for his knowledge of industry practice and straightforward approach by Chambers UK. Uh, he joined the construction engineering team upon qualification in September 2008 and became a partner in 2017. He acts for a wide range of domestic and international clients, including companies, partnerships, developers, contractors, specialist subcontractors, uh, consultants, funders, charities and individuals. And then we have Jerry Tate, who founded his architectural practice Tate Palmer in 2007. Jerry is driven by his desire to generate creative, pragmatic and unique solutions for each project. Jerry is influential across all projects and design quality is paramount. He was educated at Nottingham University and the Bartlett, um, where he received the Antoine Redoc Design Award and subsequently completed his master's degree at Harvard University, where he received the Kieran V. Kieran Prize. Prior to establishing Tate Harmer, he worked at Grimshaw Architects, where he led a number of significant projects, including the core education facilities at the Eden Project Cornwall. So welcome guys, um, nice to have you with us again this week. Uh, so kick off this week, we're going to come to you Chris, we'll take our usual look at the current COVID situation. We had an announcement from the government this weekend um, about the changes uh, that will be taking place. Um, Chris, do you think the latest amount announcements have changed much for the construction e industry legally? Uh, thank you, Annie. I mean, I think um, there's not really much by way of strict legal change as a result of uh, Monday's guidance. Um, it is, though, a very significant set of guidelines for how you go about achieving and demonstrating compliance with uh, all of the statutory health and safety requirements. Um, as such, it's very much building on the approach that the Construction Leadership Council's site operating procedures, which are currently up to update three from mid-April, uh, has sort of set the, the groundwork for. Um, I suspect both sets of those regulations will very much need to be um, developed on an ongoing basis. Uh, it'd be interesting to see the site operation procedures may well need a slight tweak now to bring them fully in line with, with what's in the government guidance. Um, but really from, from both of those, the onus is on everyone to ensure this guidance is applied on not only a site by site basis, but also an operation by operation basis to reflect how the risks of what, what is happening on the site can be managed to comply with those overarching health and safety obligations. Um, I think, therefore, it's probably fair to say that this week's guidance doesn't uh, really affect the well-rehearsed discussions that have been going on around force majeure clauses, whether anything amounts to an exercise of statutory power or change in statutory requirements for the purposes of change of law clauses. I think all of those debates remain um, pretty much as, as they have been so far and are an important area going forward. This is really about just making sure that everybody follows this thought process and can demonstrate the reasonableness of the, the steps that they're taking, um, including if there are certain operations that simply can't take place for the time being. Okay. And Jerry, what have you seen in terms of good things employers are doing to support their employees or uh, in implementing social distancing measures, those sort of things? 
Yeah, I, I, and I think, you know, what I'd say is I, I think the, the, the reaction of the construction industry like genuinely has been like really admirable. So, so you know, we, we've seen that all of our consultants are really embracing remote working and, and you know, I, I think I can't think of a single consultant who isn't sort of fully operational as it, as it were. So, so I think that's great. All but one of our sites are still open and still running. And, and again, I, I think that's really admirable. They're all trying their hardest to keep the show on the road, uh, working within the, the guidelines that, that Chris has just been talking about, of course. Um, and, and actually, one of the interesting things I've found as well is, is I'm, I'm a member of sort of, you know, four new WhatsApp groups and there's sort of regular forums at the moment with people uh, supporting each other, particularly architects who are a bit like cats quite often. They don't tend to talk to each other enough. And, and, and um, so, I, you know, it's been very, very supportive, interestingly, all through this. And I think that the reason I think that reaction is really important is because the truth is that although it is difficult, there's no reason for construction to stop. Right. There's no reason for the whole industry to just stop on a nail in this crisis. I think it is possible to continue. And I think it's really important that that message is clear, because otherwise, you know, the, the, the brutal truth is the people at the top of the pyramid here who are who are the funders and the clients are going to think, well, maybe maybe I should go on hold then, actually, if it's very difficult. You know, but I, I don't think we can. I think we can keep going business as usual. I really do. And Chris, have you found anyone who's had um, sort of unreasonable pressure to return to site when when the measures are not in place? Well, I mean, I think, yes, I have. I mean, fortunately, the vast majority of, of, of what I've heard very much accords with what Jerry was just saying, that you know, people are finding ways and means of carrying on. Um, so whilst the vast majority of people are adopting that sort of reasonable cooperative approach, I've had a few clients who've had employers just putting a lot of pressure. I must say, it's probably fair to say they've been generally employers from a non-construction background, and they're adopting this very simplistic approach of saying, well, there was never a mandatory shutdown. The government are now saying everyone should get back to work. And the trouble is they're seeing that as thinking that everything should get back to uh, entirely normal in terms of mm. you know, particularly program requirements. Um, it's been very interesting. Around a week ago, I, I listened to an event where uh, two main contractors had, had adopted very different approaches in the lockdown. One had shut down completely for around the first month and was just opening up again. Uh, and the other had kept going throughout, but with much reduced numbers on site. Um, it was interesting, both of them sort of explaining uh, their reasons behind what they'd, what they'd done. Uh, the measures they were putting in place now to, to take things forward and, and, and in particular the fact that both of them are very clear they would do the same thing again and that was really based not so much on a difference of, opin of opinion but just based on the sort of work they were doing the sort of stage their sites were at um, and you know every, everybody's going to have different ways of dealing with these things and it's not a one-size-fits-all um, answer to this um, I think what, what I have had to do where, you know, as I say, a few clients have had unreasonable expectations placed on them. Uh, what we've had to do with those is really just make sure that we are politely but firmly setting out those areas where there may be contractual entitlements to um, more, more time and potentially more money under some contracts. Um, but then actually just steer things back to talking about the practicalities. But you know, if ever there's a time that, you know, we always talk about good record keeping, if there's ever a time that that's important, it's now um, in terms of making sure that, you know, ho hopefully most things will be resolved sensibly, uh, but just having that paper trail there if it does need to be, be relied upon. Um, you know, we're we also seeing a lot of that's going on in tandem with parties actually having discussions to try and agree revised commercial terms to take projects forward. Um, all sorts of ideas are out there. I think the one thing I would say is that any new terms do need to be carefully thought through because particularly when you're dealing with the real variabilities of productivity that can be achieved at the moment and a lot of things being out of control, it's important not only that any provisions that try to share that risk are clear, but also that they're measurable in the event a dispute does arise down the line. Um, quite a few people now are forming the view actually one way through it may be to use cost plus arrangements as the basis for that because in, in many respects you can then have more of a retrospective analysis of whether reasonable steps have been taken 
rather than trying to predict the future at the moment, whilst you know, a lot does remain unclear. Okay, thanks, Chris. And talk about uh, contracts, Sarah. The government has issued some advice to parties to public sector contracts, which includes the phrase, parties to contracts should act responsibly and fairly and support the response to COVID-19 and protect jobs and the economy. Now, is this asking people to act in good faith? Should they be ignoring what the contract says in order to act collaboratively? Well, so it's a, it's a great question. Um, interestingly, I've con parties on a construction contract have always had to cooperate with each, other, with each other, even if it's not written into the contract. That doesn't go quite as far as collaborating. Some of the parties will have more collaborative contracts like the NEC suite, um, and therefore they're probably in a better position to deal with the collaborative nature of dealing with this pandemic and the effects. Um, I think the government advice has been very clear that it's not saying you should ignore your contracts. In fact, you should operate your contracts fairly and responsibly. Now, I think that's partly like teaching an industry to suck eggs, but it sounds like the government doesn't trust the industry to act fairly and responsibly. So it's giving us this guidance that says, you know what, you should be looking at how your contract works. You should be looking at what relief you can give them. You should be looking at whether you can pay them early, whether you can pay them the correct amount of money. Now, all of those are the behaviours that we should be having in any event in the industry. I don't think they're going as far as saying that there's a duty of good faith, but it seems to me that they are asking for a bit of a cultural change, a bit of saying don't rely on the strict terms of your contract don't game the contract to try and get some sort of advantage in this position both of you need to work together all of the parties on a project need to come together virtually if necessary in order to kind of agree what the future looks like and as chris said we can't predict the price and the cost and the time of all this so maybe we need to restructure our existing agreements to reflect the uncertain times we're in and the fact that we can't predict with with any sort of certainty what it's going to look like so um i think you know they're trying to nudge us towards a more collaborative behaviors in the industry and um, you know i've been saying that for years that trust and collaboration is really important i think if we had more trust and collaboration maybe we'd have had less disruptive behaviors contractually when this did first happen and I think we're going to talk about the future of contracts and stuff in a minute. But just before we move on from coronavirus, one of the shocking statistics that's come out this week is that um, construction workers are are one of the highest have one of the highest death rates in, in of all industries in the country. Uh, Sarah, do you think the industry is doing enough? Um, ooh, difficult. The problem with the industry is, unlike other industries, say the automotive industry, we don't have like five major global players. We have a million small and micro enterprises in the construction industry just in the UK. So having an industry perspective is quite difficult. A lot of the um, construction leadership stuff has been looking at big sites, big projects, and less of the sort of an extension to someone's home, a bit of work in someone's garden. Now, um, a lot of those companies are more fearful of insolvency than they are of the impact of the virus and they want to keep working. Um, but we do have, you know, 99% of the site force is male. And we know that men are more likely to die from COVID-19 than women. So I, actually, I do think that having a, a precautionary principle, a, um, an approach to construction sites that kind of looks at the fact that we're in a high risk sector, or a high risk um, site staff, would have been the best approach at the beginning but it's been a bit haphazard government guidance has been a little unclear the construction industry has been lobbying government based on both um mental health in terms of solvency and physical health in terms of covid19 and balancing the two has been extremely difficult to actually achieve and jerry in your experience have you been seeing similar things about how you feel yeah i mean i you know I, I, construction has a, a unique problem in in some ways in that you can only do it when you're physically there right so, so you can only build stuff if you're physically on site and and so inherently in this particular situation the building of stuff is 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 more risky than than other kinds of things that you can do remotely so that's difficult and every death is a tragedy obviously like every single death and every person getting ill and and, and increased risk of coronavirus is is terrible the the truth is that if you introduced any kind of new regulatory system it would take a bit of time to bed in um on sites and it, particularly as sarah's saying with the sort of smaller contractors so you know the big guys like here or someone they, they they have departments that are set up to respond very fast to to regulation changes the 
the smaller you get, the less quickly those people are set up to respond. So I think, you know, it's ambitious to expect the entire industry to sort of uh, keep going, but turn on ahead immediately in terms of following the guidelines in truth. Um, that is difficult for them to do. Ah, I don't know what the answer to that is, because if they don't sort of pragmatically get on with it and try to implement the guidelines, then um, then, then, then they'll, they'll, they'll never successfully follow them, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. it's a bit of a catch-22. That's not a great answer, but I think it's the truth. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a difficult one. I don't think there is there is an answer right now how we can deal with that. So, But um, we'll move on now and have a look at the future of um, construction, projects, design. Uh, we'll start with contracts. Sarah, is there space for better communication in the industry and how this app happened? How can we improve the way we write contracts to future proof? Um, yeah, there is definitely scope for um, improving how we communicate, improving both the structures by which we communicate, but also by the behaviours that encourage communication. So a lot of the contracts aren't very collaborative. They're very one-sided. So if you look at the JCT contract, which is, you know, 40 percent of projects at least are done on JCT. They have quite one-sided procedures, so only one party can um, initiate a, pro a certain process. If we have more collaborative contracts that uh, require both parties and all the contract administrator to sort of initiate procedures, the procedures are clear but not too rigid, that they encourage parties to sit down and decide how they're going to go forward rather than having one person who acts as a sort of um, umpire on the whole process. I think we'd have a very different approach to record keeping, to communication, to pandemics, to the unexpected happening. And we wouldn't have people trying to game the contract in order to get some sort of benefit. But I, we also need to move away from so lowest price um, tendering where we have the supply chain um, being used as trade capital. We need to move away from adversarial contracts. We need to move towards more sustainable, innovative digital contracting. And particularly where we've got a lot of paper based wet sign contracts, we can't find we haven't got access to them. You know, Jerry's in his office, but not many people are actually in their offices. They can't actually physically find the documents they need in order to know what they're meant to be doing. So, yeah, there's definitely scope. And hopefully this pandemic, one of the small benefits, um, the tragedy aside, is that it will encourage digital adoption, encourage a more collaborative approach, because I think projects that were collaborative when this happened will have better outcomes and we'll have clear evidence for that um in sort of 18 months time yeah and i think we're raising the technology um all over this week and last week, uh, the first remote trial at the technology and construction court was tape chris what are you hearing or experiencing in relation to dispute dispute resolution remotely and adjudication and all those things <clears throat> Well, I think it's it's very much fair to say that compared with a lot of other sectors, construction has started from quite a fortunate position. We've always been amongst the most progressive areas, both in terms of how the courts operate, but also there's a wider dispute resolution uh, mechanisms, mechanisms that are available to, to support that, not least, of course, adjudication. Um, I mean, I completely agree with everything Sarah was just saying, and I think, you know, at the moment, the emphasis very much needs to be on negotiating, where appropriate doing that from a, a sort of politely stated position of strength, if I can put it that way, where, where appropriate to do so. Um, one of the things that has has worked really very well in the last few weeks is mediations have swiftly uh, adapted to being held virtually. Uh, that's commonplace. I, I personally am hopeful that is something that will continue in the future. Uh, the feedback people have been giving on the whole from them is actually people get on with it and they, they can be a lot quicker. Um, it's not involving the same sort of palaver of getting lots of people in the same place and paying for a venue and all of that. Mediations have become rather long-winded and expensive. We've got to be realistic about that. And I'm hopeful one of the sort of inadvertent consequences of all of this is we might make as much, consequence, uh, as much progress in, in six months as it perhaps would have taken us five years to make ordinarily. Um, with adjudications, where they're appropriate, they are very well suited to the current situation in that most adjudications are still only on paper. And those that do require a hearing, usually the magnitude of the issues that need to be gone through is well suited to a virtual hearing. Um, a few people are actually, I think, making a very valid point that 
we may well end up with more hearings and adjudications going forward if they can be set up virtually in a much more cost effective way and in a way that again can be absorbed within the tight time scales involved um from from my own sort of client's experience we we have had a number of people who have been told in no uncertain terms they're just not going to be paid when they're due to be paid um as everyone looks after their own cash flow um adjudication i think will be important where necessary to deal with that situation particularly at the moment when the insolvency courts are essentially shut uh, and they're going to have a hell of a backlog to get through when they do reopen um the tcc yes they've been very um positive in allowing remote hearings to take place wherever they can they were very quick to develop a protocol to enable adjudication enforcement business to continue by means of virtual hearings um, and everything I've heard from, from those that have used it has been pretty positive. Um, again, I think it's perhaps an area, things like case management conferences, moving forward, will hopefully virtual hearings will become very much the norm and that will happen much quicker than it otherwise would have done. Again, just to, to save on, on the costs and keep things proportionate going forward. Um, the county courts, well, probably fair to say that's more of a lottery. They're having to adopt pretty much make up their own arrangements based on the technology and the people they've got in, in each location. Um, I think, you know, they were very overstretched going into this and I think some of them will struggle to get back on top of things. Um, but overall, as I say, I think with the can-do attitude of the TCC and the sort of inherent qualities of adjudication and new ways of mediating, I think we actually should be able to come out of this in a position where actually we make some real gains as well as having a, a, a very functional system um, in the short term. Thanks, Chris. And if anyone um, listening has any questions, we will take questions at the end, so you can uh, drop those in. Um, Just so to pick up, actually, I'm, I'm, oh, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Jerry. Well, I was going to say, picking up, you know, as, as someone who doesn't, you know, I'm an architect, right? Not a lawyer, but but just as somebody who kind of pushes forward projects, right? And our, our job is to kind of get stuff done, basically. Um, you know, it's really good to hear Sarah and Chris talking about um, emphasising, you know, collaborative approach, mediation, those kind of things, especially now, because, you, you know, it. The, again, the brutal truth is, of course, a, a client doesn't want there to be a dispute. We don't want there to be a dispute. You know, the client wants to get the job done normally. They have no interest in whose fault it is, actually. They just want the job done in the most efficient way possible. And so any way you can help achieve that, I think, is, is, a, is, a, is a benefit. Well, absolutely, Jerry. I mean, you know, one, one of the encouraging statistics that I, that I often rule out on this sort of topic is um, in the TCC, of those cases that actually end up with proceedings being issued, which is a very small fraction of, of the work that, that, that people like me do, even if those where proceedings are issued, I think it's something like only 15% of those now get to a final trial. So that the whole process and the, the attitude of the judges, the parties, the advisors is very much geared to getting settlement achieved without resorting to a trial. So, you know, as I say, we're, we're one of the leading areas, I think, in terms of that being the approach in, in the court system. So hopefully it does sort of mean we're starting from a position of strength as we deal with the inevitable problems that will, will come out of all of this. Thanks, Chris. Uh, moving on to the future of design. Jerry, the way we design our homes and our workplaces, I mean, that's something that everyone is saying is going to change. Um, look at a recent project you guys did in Chalk, Chalkhurst Court in Croydon. Every mm -hmm. one of those sites had outdoor space. Do you think this is going to be the norm going forward? Are we going to be looking at um, making sure areas have gardens or balconies? Yeah, I think it, I think it's really interesting actually trying to think through, you know, we, we've been having a, a lot of debate in the office about what what does this mean long term in terms of design and um, how long will the measures be in place? You know, uh, and uh, you know, what does it mean right now in terms of office and home design, and what does it mean in the future? And and I think there are some um, basic long term things that for sure are going to become more and more the norm. For example, having somewhere good to do your home working, uh, maybe having a third space, which is which isn't the office, which means you don't have to commute so far. Uh, but I, I I think there's kind of like in broad terms, there's definitely a trend with health, well-being and sustainability. And it's to do with, you know, giving people great daylight, great natural ventilation wherever possible, access to outdoors and access to nature. 
and that was that was happening anyway you know the the, the, the kind of the um days of the glass enclosed air conditioned office was sort of numbered anyway right but i'm sure that the outcome of the coronavirus at the end of it will be people will be much much more alert to that and and in terms of where people want to sit all day they'd much rather sit in somewhere that's you know natural well ventilated has landscape access to nature and you can do that even in tight urban settings you know it's it's not just a sort of thing that can only happen in the country yeah, absolutely. And there are um, tech giants like Google and Facebook have said they're still going to be working from home till at least the end of the year. Do you, do you think the future of work this is going to change? Is this going to be the end of going to the office? I don't think it's going to be the end of going to the office because I do think that there's a, a lot of stuff that we do in an office, peer-to-peer -peer learning, social interaction, um, f forming teams properly, that um, requires us to meet in person not rather than just virtually and particularly when it comes to junior staff um, learning the ropes so to speak but I think that offices are going to change in the sense that I you know law law firms traditionally have been very reluctant to allow people to work from home even though they record their time in six minute intervals or so um, but I think that this enforced change means that we will have the results that say that actually we've been able to service clients needs we've met all our um, um, regulatory requirements even though we've been working from home people have had a better work-life balance people have been able to work when it suits their energy rather than when it suits a strict clock based on the industrial revolution let's face it it's 150 years old the idea of 95 working so I think there will be much more adaptability and I think you know the idea that we all trog into the office Monday to Friday um, and that a benefit to the business is probably going to seem outdated and we're going to have evidence very quickly as to whether or not that's worked for some businesses and then people will also have had the experience of working from home and they'll be gunning for working with employers who want to treat them the way they want to be treated so you know hyper mobility of people and employees has been around for some time and i think they're going to vote with their feet if they're not allowed to work the way they have become used to and what they've liked i think they're gonna um you know go elsewhere absolutely i think that has been changing for a while and uh and i think this is going to be the catalyst that kind of means that employers don't have an excuse to say no no you won't get anything done at home <laughs> Jerry, did you want to come in there? yeah no i just i really like sarah's point about the evidence which is which i think this is a fantastic yeah. social experiment actually you know because i i'm sure that some things work brilliantly remotely and some things don't and and none of us knew because none of us dared like all work remotely right so now we're all doing it so let's see what happens i think it's incredible that we're going to have all this evidence in like a month or two's time we can say well that was good and this bit wasn't and we can start making really kind of well-informed decisions yeah yeah yeah. Fantastic. And another thing, Jerry, we've talked a lot um, and we've heard lots of talk about homes and workspaces. What about things like the design of museums, public buildings, uh, civic buildings, um, those sort of things? How are they going to change because of movement of people and distancing and all of those kind of things? Yeah, I think that's a really, it's a really interesting question, actually. And and I think, you know, the, the um, a lot of our clients are those kind of those kind of animals, if you like. And uh, I mean, it does kind of depend who you are and what site you've got. So there's a big kind of range. So, so say we, you know, we're doing a few jobs for the National Trust, and we work for the Eden Project quite a lot. They have quite a lot of outside space, and so they're pretty sure they can kind of convert their facilities to work, you know, within the realms of social distancing. Whereas uh, we have other kind of more urban uh, clients where where it's a bit tighter and it's a bit harder to make that work. I think all museums at the moment. Uh, if I'm, if I'm just saying well, what we're looking at them with is is looking at two modes of operation where they all suspect there's going to be like periods of time where we have to social distance and then periods of time where maybe we don't so they're looking at kind of a uh, what we're designing in for them all is now two modes of operation where when you're social distancing this is the limit of your occupation essentially and this is the way you need to manage the site and when you're not then it's going to be managed in a different way um and, and i think that's probably how all sort of more public design is going to have to go with this sort of two mode operation in, in, its, in its design process. The only other thing I'd say about all those sort of museums and things, by the way, just, just whilst there's people here, um, it's, it's a really difficult business model at the moment, museums and the National Trust and all those people, you know, they are all charities, but they all rely on people 
basically turning up and, and buying a ticket and buying a bit of cake and it and it's pretty low margin um so when the lockdown begins to ease up you know we should all really aim to try to support our kind of local museums and things because um they all they all really do need our help <laughs>